All right, so this is our NMR part two lecture. You want to listen to this lecture before you meet with your TAs through Blackboard Collaborate. Uh, before we get into the second part of this NMR lecture, let's do a quick review of our last lecture. And let's take a look at this molecule right here. And what I want you to do is I want you to go ahead and fill in this table. So we're going to fill in the table with the signal. Where do we expect that signal to show up with respect to position? So you're going to want to pull out your handout that has all of the chemical shifts listed. We also want to include integration. And then finally, splitting. So go ahead and pause this video for a few minutes. And go ahead and try to fill this table in on your own sheet of paper. So go ahead and press pause. All right, so what we would realize here is that there are actually five signals here. So there are five signals in this molecule. And we can do that by drawing out um, the individual hydrogens. So we would see that these hydrogens here are one signal. These hydrogens are a different signal. These hydrogens on the other side of the carbonyl are also a different signal. This hydrogen on the tertiary carbon is a different signal of its own. And we can see that these hydrogens here on the end, those are all one signal. So these are the different types of hydrogens here. So we can make a listing here. So here's A, and then we have B, C, D, and E. All right, so those are the different signals. Um, now, if you're looking at position, if we were to take a look at our um, let's look at signal A here. Uh, if we look at the hydrogens that are on a primary carbon, what we'd find out is that those typically show up somewhere around 0.9 by looking at our sheet. So hydrogens on a primary carbon show up around 0.9. And then if we think about integration, we'll remember integration is equal to the number of hydrogens of the same type. So we count them and we say there are three hydrogens there. Now, to determine splitting, we look at its immediate neighbors. So those three hydrogens are on one carbon. The carbon right next to it has two blue hydrogens that are different from itself. So the rule is 2 plus 1. So that signal would be a triplet. All right. So if we move on to the blue hydrogens here, uh, if we were to look at our sheet, we're looking at for hydrogens that are next to a carbonyl. And we would see that those show up between 2 and 3. And integration, there are two hydrogens, so two blue hydrogens there. And splitting. So if we look to one side of, of the, that hydrogen environment, to the neighboring carbon, there are three hydrogens there. And to the other side, there are none. So the rule is 3 plus 1. This is going to be a quartet. Now, if we look at the orange hydrogens here, uh, again, these are hydrogens that are on a carbon next to a carbonyl, so they show up at 2 to 3. There are two hydrogens of the same type. And if we look at its immediate neighbors, so there don't, there's only one carbon that's a neighbor that has a hydrogen on it. So the rule is 1 plus 1. This is going to be a doublet.
All right, so looking at this green hydrogen here, uh, this is a hydrogen that is on a tertiary carbon. And what we see is that this is going to show up somewhere between looking at our sheet 1.4 to 1.7. There is only one hydrogen of this type. And looking at its neighbors, well, there's three neighboring carbons. Uh, one of those carbons has three hydrogens. Another one also has three hydrogens. And the other has two. So a total of eight plus one, that would be a nonet. All right, last one here, the pink hydrogens here. So again, these are hydrogens that are on a, a uh, primary carbon. So these are going to show up somewhere between 0.9. There are six of these, and those only have one hydrogen that is neighbor, on the neighboring carbon. So that would be 1 plus 1, and this would be a doublet. All right. So this is just review from our previous lecture. Uh, I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page. You would have done plenty of practice with your TAs in the lab um, or through Blackboard Collaborate. And if you still need more practice with this, you want to go to your textbook where there are plenty of practice problems at the end of the chapter. Now, what we're going to do now is all of the NMRs that we've done so far are of alkanes. And uh, we've kind of spent a lot of time on alkanes. But what we're going to do now is we are going to take a look at the NMR of alkenes and benzene rings. So we're going to take a look at both of those. Uh, now that we've kind of concluded the NMR of alkanes. Now, to do that, we're going to go ahead and take a look at this PowerPoint here. And what we see here, it's, it's interesting because if you remember, I told you that the more electron density you have around an atom, the more shielded the molecule is. Well, if we look at this, we have benzene ring who has quite a bit of electrons. Um, we can see the amount of electrons present because we can draw resonance structures around here. And when we do that, that indicates that, that this molecule has quite a few electrons, but it's not shielded. In fact, it's highly deshielded. You expect the chemical shift for any protons on a benzene ring to show up between 6.5 and 8. Now, you can look at the same thing with an alkene. There's, there are electrons here in this pi bond. And yet, the which should cause some shielding, yet that shift shows up between 4.5 and 6. Same thing goes for an alkyne. In this case, there's even two more pi bonds with more electrons in it, yet this one is shielded, which is approximately around 2.5. So you ask yourself, there's no real trend here. Where is this coming from? Well, the truth is... If we actually take a look at this, the reason why is because because these um, benzene rings, these um, um, electrons in the benzene ring are traveling in a complete circuit right here. Well, when they do that, they end up generating their own magnetic field, as we can see in this slide here. And what that causes it to generate is called diamagnetic anisotropy. So as it generates its own magnetic field, as we can see in um, these uh, yellow lines here, so this magnetic field that it generates, well, these hydrogens right there get caught in that magnetic field, which pushes its chemical shift a lot closer to 6.5 to 8. Now, the same thing can be said for alkenes. They generate a magnetic field also, but not as intense as the benzene ring. And we see again that these protons are going to get caught in that magnetic field here. So they get caught in that magnetic field, which pushes that to 4.5 to 6 parts per million. Now, the interesting thing is we say, wait, we, what about the alkyne? The alkyne had more pi bonds and yet it's a lot lower, closer to 2.5.
Well, you have to ask yourself, well, what is the atom geometry of a carbon of an alkyne? Think about it for a quick second. What is the atom geometry for the carbon of an alkyne? All right, yeah, hopefully you're thinking linear, which is absolutely correct. So in this case, don't get me wrong, we still generate a magnetic field. We can see this here. So there's a magnetic field generated right here and right here. But because this is linear, this hydrogen never sees the magnetic field, right? This hydrogen never sees the magnetic field because it's linear. So that's why we see a chemical shift that's more shielded around 2.5 parts per million. Now, so what we're going to do now, now that we've kind of introduced the fundamental understanding of why these tend to be a little bit more deshielded than we would first suspect, now what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the splitting of alkenes. Now I'm going to switch to uh, some writing here to try to walk you through it, but these next slides will kind of summarize what I'm going to discuss. So let's go ahead and let's start with, let's go back here and let's discuss the NMR of alkenes. So let's start with alkenes. So when it comes to alkenes, what we need to remember is in comparing two hydrogens or two hydrogen atoms on a double bond, two protons are equivalent only if they are cis and trans to the same groups. So they are equivalent only if they are cis and trans to the same groups. So what do I mean? Well, here's case one. In case one, let's say that we have this molecule right here. And again, we're just looking at the protons. We're just looking at the hydrogens. And we're basically trying to figure out, are the hydrogens going to produce the same signal or are they going to produce a different signal? So if we take a look at this hydrogen right here and we see what is it cis to, uh, well, this hydrogen is cis to a, another hydrogen right here. Cis meaning on the same side. So this hydrogen is cis or on the same side as a hydrogen. And that hydrogen is trans, which means on the opposite side to this chlorine right here. Okay. So again, this hydrogen is cis to a hydrogen and trans to a chlorine. If we look at the other hydrogen here, so let me get rid of this now. If we look at the other hydrogen, what we see is this hydrogen is also cis to a hydrogen. Right? It's also cis to a hydrogen, and it is trans to a chlorine. So both of them are cis to a hydrogen and trans to a chlorine. So if they are the same, if they're both cis to a hydrogen, trans to a chlorine, then what's going to happen here is that we're going to produce only one signal. All right. Okay, so I'm going to draw another molecule, and I want you to try this one too. Again, all you have to do is see, are they cis and trans to the same groups? If they are cis and trans to the same groups, then they produce the same signal. Go ahead and try this on your paper. and pause the video. All right, so if you've unpaused now, but we would realize now that there is also one signal here. Again, if we look at this here, this hydrogen right here is cis to a chlorine Right. It's cis to a chlorine, and it's trans 
right? it's trans to a hydrogen. So this hydrogen here, hydrogen is cis to a chlorine and trans to a hydrogen. Now let's look at the other hydrogen over here. Let's look at um, this hydrogen here. And let me correct this really quick. This should be a chlorine right here. So if we look at this hydrogen right here, this hydrogen is also cis to a hydrogen, or sorry, cis to a chlorine and trans to a hydrogen. So if that's the case, then again, we're going to have one signal. All right, let's try another one here. All right, go ahead and pause and see if you can figure out how many signals. All right, if you unpaused, what you would realize again that there is only one signal, All right? So there's only one signal here. We can see here that H A here is, this is cis to a chlorine and trans to a chlorine. This one here is cis to a chlorine and trans to a chlorine. So they're in the same chemical environment, so we only see one signal. All right, so that was case one. And this, but all of these cases, we only have one signal. Now let's take a look and let's try this one here. If we look at this, we would see here is that um, if we were to have something like this and we try to figure out how many signals we would have, go ahead and think about it. Pause if you have to. And what we would see here is that there are two signals now, right? Because in this case, this would be HA and this would be HB. Why? Well, HA is cis to a chlorine and trans to a bromine. Well, HB over here is cis to bromine and trans to chlorine. So these are definitely in different chemical environments. So that's why these two signals would be different. Now, this is what we call geminal protons. These are what we call geminal protons. Geminal, geminal meaning the same, or Gemini meaning the same, and these hydrogens are on the same carbon. Now, what we're going to introduce now is a concept called the J value. This is also called the coupling constant. Coupling constant is the distance between two peaks in hertz. Right? So this is the distance between two peaks in hertz. So what do I mean by this? Well, geminal protons typically have a J value somewhere between 0 and 3 hertz. So when we look at this, if we're looking at an um, NMR here, what we're going to see is two signals, one for one signal for HA, one signal for HB, and they're both going to be doublets, right? Because if we look at it as a neighbor, then it's one plus one, so that would be a doublet. What we would see here is we'd have two doublets, one like this, and another like this. So the coupling constant means the distance between the two peaks, so the distance between here and the distance between here. It's very small because the hydrogens are on the same carbon, and this means that it's between zero and three hertz. Okay, so very, very small uh, because those hydrogens are so close to each other, 
those peaks would also be very close to each other. All right, let's try another example here. Let's try case three. Now let's say we have something like this. All right, let's see, go ahead and pause the video and determine how many signals you would expect to see. And hopefully you guessed that there were two signals and that is correct, there are two signals here. This would be HA and HB. So in this case, HA is cis to a hydrogen and trans to a bromine. HB is cis to a hydrogen and trans to a chlorine. So they are definitely in two different environments. Now these are not geminal because they're not on the same carbon, but they are cis protons, right? They're cis to each other. So in this case, we say they are cis protons. Now, the coupling constant, because they're farther from than geminal, the coupling constant is uh, for cis protons is 5 to 10 hertz. Right, 5 to 10 hertz. So what we'll see here is we're still going to get two doublets, one for H, a doublet for HA and a doublet for HB. But the distance between the two peaks is going to be a little farther than the geminal here. What we'll see here is that the distance between the two peaks, the coupling constant is going to be 5 to 10 hertz because the hydrogens are farther from each other. All right, let's try another one. All right, let's say we have something like this now. All right, go ahead, pause the video, determine how many signals you'd expect to see. All right, so what you would see here is that you probably you would have two signals again. So this would be HA and this would be HB. In this case, HA is cis to a bromine and trans to a hydrogen. HB is cis to a chlorine and trans to a hydrogen. So there are different chemical environments. These are not cis protons in this case. These are trans protons. So they're trans to each other here. Now we're still going to produce doublets for each signal. So we're going to have two doublets. But they're going to be much farther apart from each other now because the coupling constant for trans protons, that J, J value is 11 to 18 hertz, right? So that means that the distance between these two peaks here are 11 to 18 hertz. So this is really cool because if you, under, if you know what the J values are or the coupling constant for R, you can determine whether you have a geminal alkene, a cis alkene, or a trans alkene to help us figure out the structure of a molecule. So you can determine that based off of those values. Now let's try uh, one more and let's see what happens. So here's case five. If we have something like this. All right, so go ahead and pause the video and determine how many signals you'd expect to see here. All right, what we'll determine here is that we have three signals here. All right, so we have H, A, B, and C. Because if we see, if we look at this, um, H, A here, is going to be cis to a hydrogen and trans to a hydrogen. HB is going to be cis to a hydrogen trans to a CN group. And HC is cis to a CN group and trans to a hydrogen. So three different signals here. So then we ask ourselves, okay, well, what would you expect to see? Are we still going to see this doublet of doublets or are we going to see something else? Well, it actually gets a lot more complicated here because now we're going to have three signals. And what we see is something 
like this, right? So this is what we see here. We actually have three signals, and all of them are doublet of doublet. So we have a signal at 5.7 here. Uh, this is a doublet of doublets. We have another doublet of doublets here at 6.2, and then another doublet of doublets here at 6.6. .6. So what we're going to do now is be a, to look at this and dissect it one signal at a time to see if we can figure out which signal belongs to which. In other words, which hydrogen is at 5.7, which at 6.6, and which one's at 6.2. So let's go ahead and try that. All right, so we're going to take this one step at a time. So I'm just going to redraw the molecule over here. We'll come back to this picture in a minute. And uh, so I'm just going to redraw it here so we can work with it. And this is going to be H, A, B, and C as we determined previously. So right now let's go ahead and let's start with H, B. So what we're going to do is remember what each signal is going to get split by. Well, first things first. HB is going to get split by HA, right? It's always going to get split by its neighbor. So what's the relationship between HB and HA? Well, it's cis. So HB is cis to HA. So we ask ourselves, well, what's the coupling constant for a cis split. The coupling constant for a cis split, we noticed this before, is 5 to 10 hertz. So when we do this here, we're going to get a doublet, but the distance between those two peaks is going to be 5 to 10 hertz. All right. Now HB is going to get split by HA. This is true. But it's also going to get split by who? HC, yes. So HB is going to get split by HC. And this is trans, or sorry, geminal. So HB is geminal to HC. So we ask ourselves, okay, well, what is the splitting for a geminal split, well, we know that J is going to equal 0 to 3 hertz. So what we're going to do next is we're going to split each one of these signals really tightly, really tight, somewhere between 0 and 3 hertz. So now that means that the distance between these two right here, that is 0 to 3 hertz. Okay. So there right there is our first doublet of doublets. All right. So you might need to listen to this again um, just to get the hang of it. So feel free to do that if you need to remind. Or we can go ahead and try the next one. So let's go ahead and try the next one. And let's try to do HC now. All right, so let's do HC. All right. So when we look at HC, well, first off, who is HC going to get split by? Well, it's going to get split by HA. That's one of them. So let's go ahead and do that one first. So HC is what to HA? Well, it's trans, right? It's trans to HA. And if we look at the, what is a trans split, well, the coupling constant for a trans split is 11 to 18 hertz. So if we draw that out, we're still going to get a doublet. But now the distance between them is going to be even larger. It's going to be somewhere between 11 and 18 hertz. Now, HC gets split by HA. This is true. But it also gets split by HB. So let's take a look at that now. So HC is what to HB? Well, it's geminal, right? So HC is geminal to HB. So what's the coupling constant for a geminal split? Well, we said before that that's 0 to 3 hertz. 
So that means that we're going to split each one of these signals now really tight, really tight, somewhere between 0 and 3 hertz, right? So now there is our second doublet of doublets, right? So we have our first doublet of doublets right here. And then here is our second doublet of doublets right there. Notice that they do not look the same. All right, now let's go ahead and do that last signal. We did HB, we did HC. Now let's go ahead and try to do HA. I'm going to move this up. Um, and actually, I can probably do it right here. Let me just draw a little border so that you guys don't get confused here. Uh, I'll do it in um, brown so you realize that this is not part of that. All right, so let's do it here so that we can take a look. Well, we're doing HA. So we look at this relationship here. Well, HA is going to be cis to HB. And the coupling constant for a cis split is J equals 5 to 10 hertz. So when we do this, we can imagine that we're going to get another doublet where the splitting is somewhere between 5 and 10 hertz. Now HA gets split by HB, this is true, but it's also going to get split by HC. So HA is trans to HC, and this is a coupling constant of, again, 11 to 18 hertz. So each one of these signals, again, is going to get split, this time very far from each other, where the signal from here to here and here to here is going to be somewhere between 11 and 18 hertz. So again, here now is going to be our third doublet of doublets. Notice that they do not look the, like the other three. All right, so here are three doublet of doublets that we came up with. So take a look at that, kind of digest that. And what we're going to do is just compare these drawings now to the original picture to see if we can try to to um, identify which peak is which. Now keep in mind, this HA here are the ones where they're all the farthest apart from each other. And then HC, there's still some distance, but it's still tight geminal split. And HB, their peaks are very close to each other. So if we go back now and we look at the spectrum, right? So this is what we see here, and we compare it to our picture we should now be able to determine which signal belongs to which. And we would see um, here that the one at 5.7, this is the one that's farthest apart from each other. So the, since it's far apart from each other, this is going to be the one, this signal here is going to look the most like HA, because if we look at HA, it has a cis split and a trans split, so those are going to be very far from each other. Now if we look at the signal at 6.2, this is most likely, and then 6.6, .6, we notice that 6.6, .6, this signal here is a lot farther, those two peaks are farther from each other than 6.2. So this would suggest that 6.6 .6 is HC, because HC has a geminal split, and we see both of them have a geminal split, but HC has a trans split, where here at 6.2, this would most likely be HB, because HB has a geminal split, which we see, but it has a cis split, so trans is going to be farther than cis. So this is what we would expect to see. All right, so that is the um, NMR of alkenes. 
And um, this might be something that you need to go through again. And this is also in your textbook under the, the NMR spectroscopy chapter. Um, and in fact, this image comes directly from your book and the PowerPoint slides before this kind of review what I just said here. All right. So, um, but this is definitely something that you're going to want to go through again and make sure that you understand. Obviously, if you have any questions, you are more than welcome to either contact me or definitely ask your TAs um, to discuss it within their Blackboard Collaborate sessions. Now, so the next thing that we're going to talk about here is going to be the NMR of benzene rings. So the proton NMR of benzene rings. Now, when we look at this, if we were to look at a benzene ring here, and we draw out all of the hydrogens, so here's a hydrogen, and if I were to ask you, well, how many proton signals would be on this benzene ring, what would you say? One signal, yeah, probably one signal. Uh, you'd realize that they're all the same, they're all in the same chemical environment. Um, and where would you expect these signals to show up? Think, go ahead and take a look at your sheet if you need to, and pause the video if you have to. All right, if you looked at your sheet already, you'd realize that these signals show up between 6.5 to 8 parts per million. So we ask ourselves, okay, but what happens here if we were to add one thing to the benzene ring, right? So if we were to add something, let's say, uh, I'm just gonna put an X right here. We add an X here. Now the question is how many signals would you expect to see? So think about that, pause the video if you have to. How many signals on the benzene ring would you expect to see? Think about it. Right, so in this case, you would expect to see three signals where these signals here are the same, so these would both be HA, uh, they're in the same chemical environment. These signals would be the same, HB, they're in a different chemical environment than HA, B HA being a lot closer to X, and then this would be HC, three signals, um, HC being very far away from X, right, so that we'd see three proton signals here. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna go ahead and go back to this PowerPoint and take a look at what these look like. So if we look at this, right, we basically just said, that, you know, if we had something else on here, now we'd see three signals. So if we were to look at the NMR, what we would actually see is right here in this region is that in the 6.5 to 8 region right here, is a big mess, right? So we don't actually see the individual signals. The reason why it's a big mess is because all the signals are right on top of each other. But it doesn't really matter because if you have something in the 6.5 to 8 region and it's telling you that this big mess is worth five hydrogens, what that tells you is that you have a benzene ring with one thing on it, right? With one substituent on it. Um, so that's what it's telling you, that you have a benzene ring with one substituent on it. So if you see a, um, a big mess in the 6.5 to 8 region, and it says this mess is worth five hydrogens, that's telling you have a benzene ring with one substituent on it. Now, what happens if you have two things on the benzene ring? Well, if we're trying to look at the individual signals then, uh, let's go ahead and take a quick minute, pause the video if you have to, how many signals on the benzene ring and just the benzene ring would you expect to see? All right, so if you did this, you'd realize that there are two signals on the benzene ring. These would be the same, right? So those hydrogens would be the same. And then um, these hydrogens here would be the same. So two signals here, right? That's what we would expect to see. Now, if we were to look at this and try to determine the splitting, uh, you know, what, what would they be, doublets, triplets, or so forth, 
Well, looking at the blue hydrogen, we would say, okay, well, it has a neighboring carbon with only one hydrogen on it, so one plus one. This would be a doublet. And looking at the, the pink hydrogen here, again, its neighboring carbon only has one hydrogen on it, so this would also be a doublet. So what we would expect to see are two doublets in the 6.5 to 8 parts per million range. But what we actually see here is another mess, right? We see another mess here, this signal here, um, but now it's only worth four hydrogens. So the reason why that's the case is because if we're looking at these hydrogens here, so we look at what we initially said were the blue hydrogens, well, these blue hydrogens are not drastically in a different chemical environment than these peak hydrogens. What do I mean by that? Well, when those blue hydrogens, let's just, for example, say they look up. When they look up, what they are ultimately going to see here is a carbon. And when these pink hydrogens look down, what they're ultimately going to see is a carbon. Yes, different carbons, but both carbon. So they still end up in relatively the same chemical shift. Now we can change the situation if we make the substituents very different, right? So again, we would still see that there are two signals here, right? So uh, on the benzene ring, we'd have these hydrogens here, and then we'd have these hydrogens here, right? Now in this case, they are in very different chemical environments. Why? Because when the blue hydrogens look up, what they're seeing is they're going to see a carbon. And when the pink hydrogens look down, they're going to see an oxygen. Now they're in very big, different chemical environments. So the same is still true if we were determining the splitting. What we would expect to see are two hydrogens that are splitting as a doublet and another two hydrogens that are splitting as a doublet. And now they're in very different chemical environments. So should we expect to see that splitting? Yes, we do, right? So in this case, now we absolutely see the splitting because they're in very different chemical environments. So we can actually see those two signals, two doublets showing up as uh, two hydrogens here. Now, um, so, so we can think about how we can distinguish between a lot of these different types of benzene rings. So let's say we just talked about this situation. Let's say that we had um, X here and Y here. This is what we call the para position. So this is the 1, 4 position, which we also call the para position. So we said before that if we had this, we would expect to see two signals right, where these would be HA and these here would be HB. If that's the case, we, again, we just did this. We said HA would be a doublet and HB would be a doublet. So that's exactly what we expect to see, two signals, them being a doublet. But what if we change the situation and we put X here and Y here, which is the 1, 2 position, which we also call ortho. Or what if we change it even further and put X here and Y here, which is the 1, 3 position, which we also call meta. So go ahead and pause the video and see if you can determine how many signals are on the benzene ring for each of these cases, and then determine the splitting of each of those hydrogens. Go ahead and do that. All right, so what you would see here is that on the ortho position, so uh, on this one here with the ortho, what we would see is that there are actually four signals on that benzene ring here. All these hydrogens are in different chemical environments. I think we can agree that those two hydrogens are the same. 
as one of them is closer to hx, or so one of them is closer to x and the other one's closer to y. So these would be different from each other. Now, these signals here would also be different from each other. This signal's next to HA, so this would be HB, and then this signal's next to HD, so that would be HC. So there are four different signals here. Now, if we look over here, same thing, we'd have four different signals if we're looking at the uh, meta, right? If we're looking at the meta, we're still gonna see four different signals. So Right, this one being right between X and Y is very different from this H over here that is right next to X. This hydrogen is between two hydrogens, so that's in a different chemical environment. And this hydrogen is next to Y, so that's in a different chemical environment. So four different signals. So we ask ourselves, okay, well, signals is not gonna help us differentiate between those, between ortho and meta, but what can? What do you think? Hopefully you said splitting, yes. So we can determine the splitting of each one. So for example, if we went to each signal and determined the splitting, let's start with HA. Well, we see that HA has a neighboring carbon that has one hydrogen, so that splitting would be a doublet. Very good, this would be a doublet right here. Now HB has two neighboring carbons. Each of them have a hydrogen, so that's two plus one. This would be a triplet. HC again has two neighboring hydrogens, each with a hydrogen on it. That would be a triplet. And HD has a neighboring carbon with a hydrogen on it, just one. So that would be a doublet. So what we would see here is for the met, for the ortho position here, uh, the splitting would be different. We would see a doublet, a triplet, a triplet, and another doublet. Now let's try to do it here for the meta position, HA, neighboring carbons, none of them have hydrogens, this would be a singlet. So right off the bat, we see a difference. HB only has one neighboring carbon with a hydrogen on it, so that's one plus one. That's going to be a doublet. HC has two neighboring carbons, each with a hydrogen on it, so that's two, two plus one, that is a triplet. And HD has one neighboring carbon um, with a hydrogen on it, so that's one plus one, this is a doublet. So basically we can tell the difference between ortho and meta based off their splitting pattern because meta is going to have a doublet, a triplet, a doublet, and a singlet. So that singlet right there allows us to tell the difference between the two. So the point of this section is that there's a lot of beautiful information in the 6.5 to 8 region. You can see if there's a benzene ring uh, there by seeing if there's peaks. You can determine how many things are on the benzene ring. Is it there's only one thing attached to it or two things? And if there are two things, you can also determine where are they? Are they 1, 2, 1, 3, 1, 4? All of these things put together will help us determine the structure of an unknown molecule. So you're going to get some practice doing that in the lab this week, um, or actually I should say on Blackboard Collaborate. You're going to get some practice doing this. Um, if you're confused with any of these concepts, again, utilize your TAs during the Blackboard Collaborate to help walk you through it again, and they can try to um, explain this. I realize that this is very hard to get without really face-to-face, -face, and you know I apologize for that. I wish that I can be in front of you guys answering your questions. Um, but, you know, we're in the situation and there's not much that we can do about it, but just try to push through. If you are struggling, feel free to reach out. I can try to help you understand these concepts a little bit better. Um, but like I said, this is coming straight from your Janice Smith book uh, under the NMR spectroscopy chapter. Um, but again, do not be lost on your own. If you need help, please reach out. All right. I hope you have a good week and I will... Um, you'll be hearing from me again next week when we start doing some synthesis and start synthesizing some reactions. The first reaction will be the SN2 reaction. See you next week.